based out of London, so he's come a long way to be here for you guys. And he's willing to make sure we get our, what did you say? Your money's yeah, worth. Your so he's going to be bang here for your as buck. long as you guys. <laughs> bang for your buck. Um, but he's going to take us through uh, the making of Monument Valley, and any, we're going to, it's about a 40 minutes, and then we'll do a Q&A for any questions that you guys may have, and he's generously agreed to just hang out afterwards and answer any other questions. So, without further ado, Ken Wong, everyone. Um, so, yeah, my name's Ken Wong. Um, I'm a lead designer at Us2 Games. Um, it's great that most of you have played the game, it seems, so I'm just going to talk over the trailer. Um, so it's a mobile game for iOS and Android. Uh, we released uh, April 3rd last year, so we're almost a year old. Um, it was made by eight people in London, um, a team of, of programmers and artists and designers. Um, we didn't made it in 10 months, which is relatively short for this kind of game. Um, to date, it's made a bit over $6 million in, in revenue, and um, we've sold about um, 2.2 million copies. And uh, yeah, we're really, we're really proud of the game. It's, it's done really well. Um, it's won a couple of awards. And um, you know, the game's done so well that Apple have used our imagery when they announced new devices, uh, same as, as Google. And um, spoilers for House of Cards season three. Um, <coughs> Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Went using, yeah. yeah, but um, but actually, the the response that is most important to us and and has been the most rewarding is is seeing you know everyday people you know get into the get into our game. A lot of them who aren't gamers, who aren't you know experienced or hardcore gamers, kids and and older people and and people playing it as a family and and sharing it and and tweeting pictures at us. That that really means the most to us. And, um, and so I've, I've had this year since release to, to kind of watch this response and think about why is it that Monument Valley resonated so well with, with such a wide audience, with, with both people who, who play a lot of games and people who maybe don't have any interest in games and, and, and maybe Monument Valley is the first game that they've completed. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that us two is, is not a games company. Um, us two is uh, what what they like to call a, a digital design studio. They make they basically make apps for clients like uh, Sony, uh, H and M, Tesco, Google. Um, but uh, and they're and they're quite good at that. And what they've done is decided that in order to to keep their company culture fun and and uh, and and keep being creative, they had a games team on the side. Oh, so this is an, an example of. Uh, some of the clients we have, and this is this is the small games team that we we have. Um, so it was eight people that made Monument Valley, and uh, we're quite separate. We don't we don't work on apps, and and the people who make the apps don't work on games. Um, before Monument Valley, they were kind of known for Whale Trail, uh, which is a, a you know a game about an endless flying whale, and <laughs> <coughs> um, and and this is. This is what attracted me to, to working at Us2. Um, I felt like this is a game made with personality, and I think personality goes a long way. Um, so I think that the fact that Us2 is not a games company had two major effects on how we made games. And the first is that we're constantly reminded by the people around us that there's lots of people who don't play games. And they, they may have digital mobile devices that, you know, iPads and smartphones, and they use it for Facebook and they use it for Instagram, but, you know, maybe they say, I don't play games, I'm not good at games. Um, so we thought, you know, why, why is that? You know, they're downloading apps, why aren't they downloading games? You know, how can, how can we get that audience? Um, and the, the second thing about working at a design studio, working at a, a digital design studio, is that uh, we started to see games as user experiences, right? You know, there's a lot of similarities between the way that people consume apps and the, the way that people navigate and, and learn and, and play games. Um, and that was, that was really useful. Um, 
And I, th I think um, this UX-driven approach um, allowed us to frame the team's high-level goals like this. What is the most amazing experience that we can create on this, on a mobile device? And, you know, not, you know, let's not try and design a PlayStation game and try to, you know, port that to the, to the iPad or, or a PC game. Let's make something that's dedicated to this. Let's even forget about whether it's a, it's a game or not. Um, there's a lot of debate about what is a game and what isn't a game. And some people describe, they're more comfortable describing Monument Valley as interactive art or it's, a, it's an app. You know, people, are, they don't feel as weird of saying, oh, I downloaded an app rather than a game. Um, and to us, it's just like a thing, a thing that you can have on the iPad. So um, I decided to call the, the topic of this talk today, building a better video game, because I, I think that there are, there is a tradition of making video games that's a little bit antiquated now. Um, uh, and I, I think it's, it's the time is ripe to revisit, you know, our game's culture and, and a lot of our preconceptions about what a game is, or what a video game is, and, and, and how we make them. Um, so first of all, um, I feel that, um, you know, a lot of people ask about our process, and I, I think that what we do is we have a kind of a lack of process. We like to, to not have a, a rigid plan, and, but instead remain fluid and, and, and keep iterating keep, and, fail, and fail fast, fail aggressively. Um, so to, as an example of that, um, when I first had the idea from Monument Valley and I presented it to the team, um, it's not like we just signed off and we said like, hey, we're going to spend 10 months working on this. Um, to kind of validate the idea, we made you know, a prototype. This is the very first uh, prototype level we made of Monument Valley. And it's, it's really basic, really rudimentary, but it, it kind of shows what we were going for, and, and we got sort of that feeling of optical illusion. And this was playable on an iPad, um, which is important. You know, we're, we're, we're not just testing the game mechanics, we're testing the whole UX, the whole system. Um, so this is a simulation with the mouse cursor, but we had this playable on an iPad, and I, I brought it to a team of people, perhaps a bit like yourself. You know, maybe not all of you are gamers, um, maybe not all of you play a lot of games, but, you know, you can use iPads, you can... You can, they're, they're touchable, they're friendly. And when we presented to, to people in our company and they were willing to come over and try this and, and play with it and explore it, um, we knew that we, we had something. You know, there was something about the way that the, the art was presented and the colors and the, the simplicity of it, um, that it was a lot more, a lot less assuming than, than traditional video games. Um, so when we went, so you know, after this process of like um, saying, okay, we have a prototype that works, we went through a, a more exploration, just trying to trying to figure out what the soul of this thing was, and and you know, exploring different colors and different architectural styles, and um, in, integrating a bit of hipster typography, and <laughs> and seeing like how can we, I don't know, like I, again, because we're working in a design studio, how can we bring in elements? of that, how can we bring in um, visual expertise and interesting typography and, and interesting color choices, you know, obviously going far away from real, realism, which I think um, a lot of games overly focus on. Uh, how, how, how many people on your team are able to do, like, this is like, this is, is it like beautiful artwork? Oh, thanks. Are, are there a bunch of artists on the team or what? Uh, well, this, all this stuff up, up until what we've seen is that's just me. And then with the prototype, that's with another programmer. Um, and the, the final team just had one other artist. But I'll talk a little bit more about how that's not the full story. <laughs> um, and, uh, and this is a lot of us doing sketching. This is how we come up with levels, just like throwing ideas at the wall, drawing mad designs. But it's, it's, it's interesting because it's not just designing the visuals. It's not just the graphics of the thing. We're actually designing stories and, and things that move and change um, in three-dimensional ways, sometimes fourth-dimensional. Um, a, a lot of mad scrollings like this. Um, but not, not everything that we sketched out, not everything that we came up with ended up in the game. These are just a few of the sketch levels that we came up with and we tried 
and didn't end up in the final product. And you know, here's an old version of the ending, and here's an old form of, of what we, we thought the storytelling was. And here's this level that was supposed to be our prototype level, our, our demonstration of what Monument Valley would be, and it utterly failed, right? This was a terrible user experience, and we had to watch people spend 25 minutes getting lost in this thing. Uh, and we, but we had to go through that in order to learn how to make good Monument Valley levels. Well, one of the things that we did correctly, or one of the things we did well, was balancing um, sort of an artistic voice, a, a sense of artistic expression, and, and a story that we wanted to tell, with also examining how users interacted with the device and how users interacted with, with the game. So Monument Valley has its origins in in, in me personally, um, I have a, sort of a layman's interest in architecture. I love traveling. I love seeing buildings. Um, and I was, I was always thinking about how to make architecture into a game. And sort of the catalyst for that came when I was, I was looking at this image by MC Escher. And I saw the, how it was framed. Um, you know, the, the, this one building was framed in a void. Uh, and, and I think that puts the emphasis on the building rather than on characters. Um, and, and I observed this little character in the, in the, at the bottom of the building, and I thought if, if the point of the game was to guide a character through the building uh, by manipulating the, the architecture to the highest point, that would, that's, kind of giving, uh, that's kind of making a game out of the architecture. The other sort of catalyst, the other thing that made me realize how we could make Monument Valley was this game, Windowsill. Uh, and it was originally a, a flash game. Um, you can also get it on an iPad now. And what's amazing and, and wonderful about Windowsill is that it's very playful and it's very visual based. There's, all you have to do is kind of get this little car uh, through the door. And all this other stuff is actually just for play. It's just inter interacting. Uh, but they're beautiful, right? It's just a fun experience. And when I when I when I played this, I'm like, wow. There's you don't have to create. You don't have to have a like a full-on story. You don't have to have complex mechanics and complex puzzles. There's so much just delight and whimsy and, and enjoyment that you can get from this very visual but very interactive experience. Um, so this led to the first piece of concept art for. Monument Valley, and this was kind of our design document. We kept coming back to this and saying, like, what is it about this that, that the people in our studio reacted to and, and loved? And they said, like, wow, what is that? What, you know, I thought you were making a game, but, but this looks like art. What's, what's the deal with that? Um, and then we you know, explored uh, architecture from, from all around the world. And, uh, and again, that, that going back to that idea of composition, I started exploring this idea of little worlds. So like, you know, structures or levels or arrangements of things floating in a void. And there's, there's something about that, that that resonated really well and mapped really well to game design. I think there's something really comforting about being able to see the whole world at once, right? Everything that you need to solve a puzzle is within this space. And, and as you can see, our, we looked for inspiration in more than just, uh, more than just other games or, or, or our favorite films. We're looking at sculptures and architectural models and poster design and, and bonsai trees. Um, so, but, but you know, beyond all of this, um, you know, all these dreams and all these designs and saying like, we're gonna make this and it's gonna be awesome, we also really wanted to pay attention to, to the UX of it and, 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 and how the players were going to react and, and see things from that perspective. Uh, so like I said, we, we thought a lot about why people don't play video games. Um, you know, people would express that they're too hard, that they're, you know, it costs a lot to get a PlayStation and, and it, it, takes, it's, it takes a lot of time to, to get through a full-size PlayStation or a PC game. Um, there's this feeling that Games exclude a lot of people. You know, like this is a boys' game, and like this is a game for serious people, and, and this is a game. This is a hardcore game. Um, you know, uh, maybe the gaming world doesn't always welcome um, a, a wider audience. There's this perception that games are a bit meaningless. They're a waste of time. They're you know just for children. 
And even if we overcome all of these barriers, there's still the perception that lingers on, you know, from the 70s, from the 80s, um, that, that, that games are, aren't for everybody. Um, so, we're, we're, so with these problems in mind, uh, you know, and just we're trying to focus on, on what, it is, what's, what, what it is we're working with. And, you know, in my head, like, what the iPad is, is it's a computer for everybody, right? A computer is difficult to use, they're expensive, they're, you know, you have, there's so many hidden commands and stuff, and here's the iPad, here's Steve Jobs saying, like, we're gonna, we're gonna make this magical device, um, and, and what it really is, is it's a computer that anybody can use, and that was, that was really inspirational to us. So, you know, what if we're trying to make a computer game that everyone can use? And, and I think a, a, a lot of it has to do with the interface, with the fact that you're directly touching the screen, and it creates sort of an intimacy with the, with the users. Um, designing games for touch is different because touch is less accurate, right? So we don't want to punish users because they're, they're swiping the screen in the wrong way. Um, we have to take into account that the hand is covering the screen at, at, at some point. Um, you know, there are different screen sizes we have to deal with iPhone, Four, iPhone 5, uh, iPad mini, full-size iPad. Um, people are going to be playing this in shorter play sessions, right? Um, maybe 10 minutes at a time. Maybe they're playing it on the subway. Um, and, you know, they don't want to be using all their brain power. They're, they're probably playing a game on their mobile device to relax uh, more so than trying to beat challenges. Um, there's no guarantee that we're going to be able to use audio as a tool because some people are going to be playing this in noisy environments without headphones. And overall, there's this sort of a low commitment from the player. They haven't spent $60 buying the game. Um, they, they may have just bought the game on a whim. They may close it at any time and, and do something else. So we, have to, we really have our work cut out for us. Um, again, in terms of UX, you know, um, we use or test uh, very frequently and from a very early point in the project. So you know, as soon, from the very first prototype, we were always testing with you know, our, our colleagues in the studio, uh, visitors to the studio, um, and always um, testing without any instruction, you know, allowing them to, to play the game and observing where they got frustrated um, or stuck. Um, I think part of our solution to, to some of these problems was um, trying to create elegant onboarding. Um, and, you know, Monument Valley was designed from the outset to be very have a, have a big visual impact. And, and the kind of point was, you know, here's something that's so beautiful. Here's something that you've never seen before in, in the form of a screenshot, in the form of a trailer. Um, if we can make a, a big enough impact, hopefully that's enough to convince someone to download the app and start playing. But once they did that, we had to make sure that the interactions were smooth enough and intuitive enough that it wasn't frustrating, that they could just get it by themselves. You know, um, even someone who who is not versed in gaming vocabulary, um, that they would stay in the app, that they would, they'd, they'd keep participating. Once, once we have that, once we have people staying around for a while, then we can build up character. We can get them to start empathizing with the main character, start, start identifying with the world. And, and once we have them for, for, for a bit longer, then, only then can we kind of get into the deeper story and themes of the game. I think that you know, part of the problems that, that makes games inaccessible is they try to give all of these things at once. They, they, they ask too much of the audience. And like I said, we have, we have an audience that is, is naturally skeptical, naturally have um, low commitment to the work. So we have to, we have to really work on onboarding. Um, I think that unlike a lot of other mobile games, we, had, we have this emphasis on quality over quantity. Um, and there's, there's a couple of other ways that I would describe this. I think that um, our philosophy was that less is more. So in, you know, instead of trying to give you as much game and as, as many features as possible, let's, let's try and, and, and keep it simple and, and be elegant. Um, I felt like we, we worked with a sense of restraint, like trying not to make everything really loud and, and have as many things as possible and use bright colors. We, we, we tried to, to be subtle and, and be simple. And, and as long as that worked within the context, it, you know, it could still make a, a strong impact. I think that having a different set of priorities uh, and, and values and what we think is important in a game, that naturally leads to 
um, to innovation because everyone else seems to be kind of doing things the old way. Um, so some examples of, of how this, this thinking worked. Um, you know, traditionally, um, a lot of content is valued in, in video games. You know, people want to make, oh, we, may have, we have 100 levels, we've got 300 levels. Um, you know, the game lasts 20 hours or the game lasts 80 hours. We started to recognize that a short experience may actually be better. You know, you guys are all busy. Perhaps you have families, perhaps you've got busy jobs. Maybe you want to get through it in the same time that you can get through a movie. You know, maybe that's actually better value for you. For you to, and, and we realized as we were testing that, um, that there's tremendous value in actually completing the experience and completing the story and getting a sense of catharsis at the end. Um, we felt during the development that surprise and pleasure were more valuable than difficult puzzles. And we're really worried about this because you know, a lot of people are going to see this as a puzzle game. And there are things that are a bit like puzzles, but that's not really the point. We don't want, um, we don't want people who are interested in the visual experience and in the story to be prevented from accessing that by really difficult, tough puzzles. So we designed it, so this, this very delicate line of like creating puzzles that felt challenging but could be completed by everybody. Um, and, that, and, and, we, and we really felt like that that decision was, was best for the audience at hand. Um, it's, it's a very common trope in games to lead the player on with coins and gems and, 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 other, and just collectibles because people like to have stuff. They like to collect stuff. They like to feel rich. They like to you know, acquire. And we realized as we were making Monument Valley that that wasn't really in line with the themes that we were describing, right? You know, here we're trying to do a quality thing, a beautiful thing, um, you know, and you're playing this, this silent princess and she's kind of on a quest for forgiveness and it didn't really make sense for her to be picking up gold along the way. <laughs> and and to, to us, you know, what we realized is we didn't need these artificial rewards. You know, in playtesting, we discovered that people naturally wanted to ascend and, and get to the highest point and getting there was reward and enough, you know? Um, and, and I thought that, that was very tr satisfying because it allowed us to declutter the world, right? We don't have to have all these artificial rewards. Let's just keep it simple. Um, and I think, you know, maybe not on purpose, but kind of retrospectively, we realized that it was important to allow the player to feel and think for themselves. So there's very little instruction in Monument Valley. We don't, we don't say this is what you should do and how to do it. We, we just present the world and, and through architectural design, through visual design, we try to lead the player and, and guide them towards completing things. And, and people feel smart. People feel smart of like, ah, I see what I'm supposed to do. Oh, that, you know, this happened the way that I, that I thought it was going to. Um, and this extends also to, to, to people's feelings. We don't use music to say, here's the sad bit and here's the exciting bit. Um, the the music is very laid back and, and very, very zen-like, very ambient. Um, because we wanted people to engage in the game emotionally um, by themselves. Um, that's why the main character, Ida, uh, doesn't have a face and doesn't have a voice. We don't want her to be acting out what's, what's happening and, and her feelings. By, by kind of keeping her blank and, and, and making her sort of an empty vessel, we found that people would empathize more with her and, and tell their own story. They would imagine what she's thinking and, and, and feeling and, and therefore create the sense of empathy. Um, so to your point, um, I think that uh, one of the strengths, one of the things that made Monument Valley strong was tight integration between art and programming, which are normally seen as, as very separate disciplines. Um, you know, my, my background is in art. I, I, I started in the games industry as a concept artist and then graduated to be an art director and I've, I've always been very visual, but I can also do programming. I've, I also taught myself a little bit of enough coding that I could make my own game. And the lead programmer of Monument Valley has also made his own game and therefore can put together a bit of art. Um, and that, you know, that's, that wearing multiple hats, um, that, that sharing of disciplines, really helped us have a, have a really good dialogue and come up with, with um, solutions in a way that I thought was, was better than coming up with that, than, than working separately. So when I first came up with the idea of Monument Valley, 
and I was drawing on an isometric grid, um, I actually had to be conscious of not creating impossibility. You know, there's, there's, it's, it's really easy, actually, to create um, impossible connections on an isometric grid. And so I said to the, to the programmers, like, could we actually do this in the game? Could we use forced perspective, you know, te techniques that I'd learned from, from observing how special effects in movies are done, um, could, could we actually fake things? Could we, could we put things out of depth? And, uh, and it's like, yeah, yeah, that's possible. You know, we can actually create this in real life. If you see this Penrose Triangle sculpture from exactly the right angle, it, 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 it creates an impossible uh, 3D shape. And so this is kind of, this is how it works in the game. You have something that you see in the game only from one angle, but in actual fact, um, it is separated. Uh, the real trick is how to do that with characters. So here you see Ida on the right. This is, what I, this is what you see in the game. And on the left is what's happening uh, in reality behind the scenes. So you see that she pops in depth. But because she's either moving directly towards the camera or directly away from the camera, you don't perceive um, that, she's, that she's actually changing location. So this is an example of, I think, how artists and programmers worked really, really well together, which I think is necessary for, for video games. You know, video games is a combination of these disciplines. It's a half, half the coder used to telling her, like, hey, actually, you can walk around, um, across that. Magic. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's actually, um, there's actually uh, invisible nodes. So there's, like, you can imagine that if this is a square, there's a, whole, there's, there's a, a, a node for each one of these tiles, yeah. and there are connections between them, and what happens is, we only look at those nodes in screen space. We only look at it from this perspective. And if, 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 the, node, if the nodes are kind of adjacent, then they're considered linked. So basically, if it looks like they're next to each other, then, they, then they create, it creates a connection. So the game says, like, OK, you've got a node here and a node here. And even though they're out of depth, uh, we know that she should be able to walk across. And the game figures out that, that she, I'm going to move Ida that much. Um, I think that, and this, this seems kind of obvious, but creating a better video game uh, requires understanding what video games are, right? A better understanding of the medium, and in particular, this specific platform and, and the audience and, and how they're going to perceive value. Um, I don't think that the games industry has a very good grasp of what video games are. Um, as an example, I, I don't think our industry was named correctly. Um, to make my point, um, I, I, I tried thinking about why we play video games. Um, and I think that there's, there are some people and there are some games that demonstrate this where it's about mechanics. It's about, you know, people play video games to improve skills, overcome challenges, beat opponents, they're, engage in risk-reward dynamics, and, and they'd like to complete things, right? These are, these are gamey things that we can observe in sports, board games, gambling. And, and this is how a lot of the, the earliest video games were. The simplest thing was to emulate these things, make digital versions of them. However, um, there, I, I believe that there are people who engage with video games for other reasons. You know, they come for good stories. They come for good characters, um, for the visual and audio stimulation. For the, 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 they come to see strange new things that they've never seen. They like to be immersed in, in new worlds. And you know, these are not really the same as, as sort of traditional games, as board games and card games and sports. These are more similar to walking through a museum, right? Or, or watching a film or reading a book or going on a, on a, on a fairground ride. Um, and it, you know, I was trying to reconcile these, these these two sides, these like, you know, how come, you know, we have these things that, in video games, we have these things that are more like games, and on the other side, we have these things that are more like experiences, perhaps? And, and I, I think that's why this creates a lot of debate uh, about what is a game and what isn't a game. And, and the truth is that I think video games are actually best described as digital interactive experiences. Um, so I think with this knowledge, right, like, and I was, and I was, and I was as I was demonstrating with the iPad, um, knowing what the thing you're making and, and, and knowing the full possibilities of that 
is, is super helpful and, and, and really advantageous. Um, in terms of value, there's the tradition in mobile games to, uh, like I said, like, I don't know, treat the users like idiots, um, um, create tons of boring levels or, or a lot of repetition or a lot of frustration and make games for free, right? A lot of mobile games are free and then later on they ask you for money or they, or they put ads in the game. Um, for us, we decided to price our game at the ludicrous price of $3.99, um, which, which, but I, I think that signals that this is a quality game, it's a quality experience. And again, very unconventional, we're actually making a shorter game, we're making less game um, than usual, but you know, it's a game that looks like this. You know, it's, it's not about the quantity of time, it's, it's the quality that, uh, of the content. Ultimately, though, I think what made Monument Valley great and, and the best way to make games is the team. Um, you know, I don't know how it worked out, but the eight of us just worked really well together. We were really honest with each other. I guess I think a really strong part of that is that, um, you know, I was new to the team. I joined the team only two years ago, right at the start of this project. And, and, then, and then some of the others had worked together before, but there was this sense that um, there were no holds barred, nothing was gonna be assumed. This is the new version of the games team and we're just gonna be really honest with each other and do games differently. We're, we're gonna um, not be trapped by the traditions and tropes that have held back games previously. We're just gonna be really honest and brutal uh, uh, with ourselves and, and, and push the envelope. Um, if you're interested in um, making uh, games, perhaps getting into game design yourself. Um, I would recommend checking out Indie Game the Movie, which is uh, a documentary that uh, I believe is streaming on Netflix right now. Um, and it's a story about kind of this wave of indie independent games where we're, tr we're trying to be more independent, trying to be more creative, more personal in the way that we make games. Um, and it's a great story about, about the scene, about um, and, and the stories of, of three different game developers. There's another game, a game development documentary called Game Loading that um, has, has recently been completed and um, is not quite online yet. It's actually, there's, a, there's a premiere for it on, on Thursday going on at the Game Developers Conference, but I think it's sold out. But um, it's, it's tremendous. It's like the next level up from Indie Game, the movie, because it tells the story of, of many, many game developers and, and the scene as it is now where, you know, like Monument Valley, there's tons of games out there that are trying to be more visually exciting and trying to be more, more personal and trying to, to, to examine the traditional model of games and, and explore how else can we make games? How can we bring in influences from architecture and dance and photography and, 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 and you know, let's, let's try and make games more culturally viable and, 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 and relevant, and how can we make games for everybody? Um, if you guys were to have one takeaway from this evening, um, I would have you believe that video games are an emerging art form. You know, I think that popular culture has this image of games, which is it's not really representative of, of where we are now. Um, you know, gamers are not just teenage boys in their basement being really antisocial. Games are played by men and women and boys and girls and LGBT, LGBT people and people in the Middle East and people in Brazil and people in China. And they're not just about violence and sex anymore. They're about, um, you know, cancer and uh, relationships and love and uh, friendship and uh, you know everything that you could everything that you could experience in your life uh, could be made into a game and and could be expressed in a way that you can 't in a in a film or a book um, and so it 's a really exciting time to be getting into games um, because we 're still we 're still pioneering right we 're still having adventures like discovering new ways of expression and and, and new ways of of, of discussing things um, so i 've tried to keep it short and, and pretty brisk because I want to answer your questions. Thanks very much for, for listening. <clears throat>
more questions? Come on. Don't be shy. You can yes. Recall. At what point in the creation of the game did you come up with the story? Because it seems like you guys came up with visual scripts and all that. And yeah. How um, did that story get forward into there? Um, well, like I said, like you know, when I had that that big target of a of a graph. Where's my Where's my cursor? There we go. Um, you know, I think that this is mimicked. So this is, I think, how people digest the work. But I also think it's how we created it. We started from a visual point of view, and then we developed the interactions, and then we figured out who the, who the characters were. So we're like, you know, you saw in the early prototype that it was the main character is just a white block moving around, and then we're like, what? Well, who is that white block? How can we do something to this white block to, to generate more empathy or, or, or visually help um, the experience? And so sketching like, what is the, what is the most minimum, minimal character? You know, I didn't want to, she, she doesn't need a face. She doesn't need that to act, to, to create empathy. Um, she, doesn't need to, she doesn't need to carry a gun. She doesn't need a backpack. Um, and I don't know, this princess design came. And actually, she came from shape design. You know, Monument Valley is very geometric, and Ida, uh, where do we have Ida? Ida is, a, you know, she's got a triangle for a hat and a, a sphere for a head, and another triangle for her dress and, and lines for legs. So, um, and then, I don't know, somehow along the way, I came up with the idea of crows. They're, I don't know, crows are annoying. So, I, you know, again, in, in line with the values of, of, of what we're trying to do, we're not creating enemies. You, there aren't enemies that you kill in Monument Valley like there are in a lot of other games. There are crows who are, who are annoying and get in the way, but you don't, you don't solve your problems by killing them. Um, you you kind of you have to just move them out of the way, and then, and then you find out later in, in that they're not, they're not bad. They're actually just kind of misguided or mindless. Um, so that was us developing character and actually for a long time you know many months to the project we didn't know what the story was and I had to convince the team that that's okay you know we're gonna we're gonna that people don't people don't pick up the game for the story right um, they may they may pick it up for the character they're gonna see this art and they'll be like oh that's a that's a game about this um, but they don't know what the whole story is so front loading the story doesn't really make any sense. We, you, you don't want to start an interactive experience by saying, once upon a time, there was a thing in the jig. Um, but visually, we, we, we build up the world, we, we introduce the characters, and then, gen and then gradually you start seeing a story. And it was, and it was just about like, how can we cre create a through line where Ida has a resolution, the crows get a resolution, the valley of monuments gets a resolution, and just trying to figure out how to tie that together. Um, early on, we had a, a much more complicated version of the story, and uh, through testing, we realized it was much too ambitious. We were tr we were still trying to be like a film, with like you know proper character arcs. Um, and what I realized is that um, in this case, our video game wants to be a bit more like a music video, and a music video doesn't have to have like a literal story like a three-act story, it just has to has, have arcs, have, have very simple arcs of like something happened. Um, and with that approach, again, I had to kind of convince the team and, and work with them and say like, it's, it's gonna be enough to just um, have a very simple journey for, for Ida. And, and people are gonna recognize that and, and I think have an emotional impact. Interesting too, because we, we had a Pixar guy. Right, two Pixar guys. Oh, cool. And they follow the exact opposite process. Right? It's like they start with story, right? The characters, then develop the visuals. It's so interesting that you can actually flip it, and it still works beautifully. Yeah. Well, they don't make very good video games, do they? So. <laughs> <laughs> was there a specific inspiration for the story, or was that just something you guys came up with? Um, I. I'm just firing from the hip. I'm just like, I don't know, I feel like doing this. In, in retrospect, like my, my, a friend of mine, I, I, it's, it's open to interpretation, I think. And a friend of mine made a funny, uh, an interesting observation that she felt that it was, it was kind of post-colonialist. You know, you have this white character with these black characters, I don't know. Um, no, I don't know, I, it's... Um, 
I, 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 I don't think, I don't know, I'm not sure. I, I, don't, I try not to overthink it because I do want everyone to make their own interpretation. It's, it's intentionally open-ended because that's interactive storytelling. It's not all about me, the author. It's we're, we're authoring this together. Any question? Yep. One of the things that I think as designers we struggle with a lot is uh, being able to measure like surprise and pleasure and these values that we actually do want to bring into the experience, but it's hard to like fight for them sometimes in yeah. larger products or larger companies. Um, I'm curious to know how you maybe evaluated some of these like surprise and pleasure more valuable than difficult puzzles. And sure. How do you make that call for testing? Um, so how do we evaluate surprise and pleasure and delight in testing? Um, I think where, where game design differs perhaps from maybe what some of you are used to is that we have one foot in uh, the design world perhaps and then the other foot in the entertainment world where we're you know, creating stuff not because it's useful but because it's strictly for entertainment. And so... Um, there is an aspect of not everything has to have a point or not everything has to have a, have a use. And I don't know, it, it, it does become a bit subjective, I guess. But I mean, you can watch people and just observe their faces and say, like, um, you know, are they genuinely having fun? Are they genuinely interested in it? Um, um, and you can tell when people are bored. Like, like, the most frust the, uh, when we first were testing, people would be very polite and they'd be like, "Yeah, this looks great. You know, I'm I'm really having fun." And and we could tell that <laughs> they were being nice. And and but oh my god, when they were frustrated, that like exha exhaustion was the word that we would use. We could say like, "Oh my god, they're exhausted from playing our very beautiful game." Um, and um, yeah, just uh, observing. And it's it's one person at a time. We don't we don't. Like, we don't do focus groups. We just, um, you know, every, when we were testing heavily, like every day we'd have two or three people, uh, one at a time, sit down on the couch, and the whole team would kind of like look over their shoulder, or, or they'd be playing on the iPad and it'd be mirrored on the screen so we can observe from a distance. Um, it is hard to quantify, but in the end, and, and that's where it's like, it's, neat, it's not black and white, it's like, um, we would observe and then discuss after, and, and we would say, like, I think they got really frustrated there, and they're like, really? I don't, I don't know, and we'd just discuss it. And someone would make a call and say, like, well, I think we should, we should fix that. And, um, and uh, but, but move very fast, iterate really fast, so that we, we would never commit to, like, you know, trying to solve things over two weeks or, or a month. We would, and, and we, we, you know, everything was kept as simple as possible with, with really good tools so that we could fix things in an afternoon and then test again. Yep. How did you know when you worked out? Um, that's a good question. Um, we didn't want to waste money, so we said we're, we're going to set a deadline and we're going to be quite committed to it. and. From pretty early on, you have to start talking to Apple and saying like, hey, we're working on this great thing. Um, when would be a good time to release it? And they won't guarantee that they're going to feature you on the App Store, but they'll say like, uh, April 3rd's a good date. You know? By which it means like, hopefully they like us enough that, they're not gonna, that we're going to be the biggest game coming out on April 3rd. And, uh, and that's, how it, that's how it worked out. So we knew that if we're going to be releasing on April 3rd, we have to submit by March 3rd to have enough uh, leeway. Um, and you know what they say, you, you never really finish a thing, you just release it into the wild. And you know, we, we didn't know that it was gonna be, um, I mean, we, we saw all the flaws, we still see all the flaws, and, 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 uh, but we had to release it. We, we had to give birth to the thing and say bye to it, um, put it out into the wild. Um, but, uh, after the game came out we, and, and was successful, we made more levels. We did one more pack of levels. And even as we were dis <laughs> Whoa, easy. Um, even as we were discussing um, the, the, the start of those new levels, we were like, I think this is going to be the last levels that we ever do. You know, we don't want to 
make Transformers 2 and 3 and 4 and Harry, and you know, like, we don't, we don't want to keep making sequels. Um, we don't want to be that, that studio. We, th we think that we, we came here to be creative and, and be innovative and tell stories. So, um, in a sense, I guess we knew that we were done when we had, like, kind of a second shot at it and we were like, hey, we, we have some unfinished business. We want to go back to some of those levels that we, we couldn't figure out at the time. Now, with this knowledge, we're going we're gonna to make eight more levels that are going to wrap up um, the Monument Valley experience. And I guess now we're finished. <laughs> and then Apple said, like, hey, do you want to do this charity level for us? And we're like, all right. <laughs> uh, there was a question. So many hands. All right, can you decide? Um, can you talk a bit more about your prototyping experience? Do you, like, what's your concept use of the developer and build it right on the iPad? Or is there something that's like the workability? Yeah, um, so have any of you heard of the Unity engine? All right, so Unity is like a really great environment for making games because you can prototype really rapidly uh, and push the device straight away. Um, uh, so right now we're prototyping actually, and uh, so you know sometimes we have what teams of one or teams of two or three, and um, a lot of discussion and a lot of just like let's try the, let's actually we're, we're I wouldn't say we're very good at prototyping we're still figuring out how to do it, and one of the things that I'm trying to help the other designers with is when you do a test try and get a try and get a yes no answer try and be like. And this kind of comes back to your question, like, is it fun or not? Um, try to quantify that. Try to, to, to figure out, is, is the gameplay mechanic that you came up with, this idea, is it, is it working or is it not? Um, otherwise, if it's somewhere in between, it's like, I, it's kind of working, or it will work if we work more on it. That's, that's a really dangerous area where you could get a year down the track, and you're like, oh, that thing that we thought was going to work, it, it never actually, we never actually made it work. Um, um, I, I, I just think rapid prototyping is, is really important, just getting, getting through things really fast and testing it on device. Um, you know, uh, having the thing in their hands. We were bouncing between iPhone and iPad and, and trying to, you know, like, how does it work on iPhone? Is it going to be, is it gonna be too small? Are we going to have zooming? And, um, yeah, does that answer your question? Um, yes? Um, you had mentioned briefly, like, you're part of a larger company and yes. a small team. Yes. How was the conversation going with a game that's so, I guess, not safe in the classical term? Like convincing or having that conversation to get right. this push through? So um, the owners of us two are two guys. That's called us two because it started from two people. And they're two graphic designers. And they're like you guys. They're like normal. They're not, they don't wear suits. Um, <laughs> and you know. They, they just said, like, hey, it'd be cool to have a games team and just make cool apps. And that's going to help. That's going to make the company look good, right? It's going to help get clients when we say, like, hey, we just made this thing and put it on the App Store. And for a long time, actually, they ran at a loss, you know? Um, it was written off sort of as a PR thing, right? Like, it's going to make our company look good. We're going to have this little... We, when people come to visit the studio, they're like, hey, we have this cool own IP team. Um, and... The remit, so the remit was never to make profit. You know, it's never like you have to make a lot of money or you have to make any money. It's just like do your best to make amazing things, and we believe that that'll pay off in the long run. And and that went pretty well. You know, Whale Trail was a pretty big, pretty expensive project. We're, we're based in London, um, and um, I think it's in the black now. But it, it, you know, it didn't make as much money as they would like. And but there was this, they had this idea to like kind of invest a bit more in the games team. And so I came on, and I'm from the traditional games industry, and a couple of the others. Um, and 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 again, the, the owners were just like, don't worry about profit, just make something amazing. And we're like, wow, okay, that's 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 a serious responsibility. Like, I mean, it's not often that you get a brief that like that, um, and and I, and and because of that responsibility, we felt like we had to push the envelope as, as hard as possible. And you know, people ask like, what is the most difficult thing about the project? And I say like, well, everything, because if it if it was easy, then we would make it difficult for ourselves. You know, we would we would push it and try to. To solve problems and, and, and you know like you know how much graphics fidelity can we can can we get how much performance can we get how many animations can we fit in how how minimal can we get it right how can we remove things until nothing else can be removed 
um, how, 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 how much can we push the color palettes? Um, uh, so, so I, you know, we were just trying to push and be as bold as possible, I, again, but also keep in touch with users and, 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 and keep UX in, in, in mind. Um, in the end, I don't think it's actually that risky a project. You know, someone actually, another games designer wrote a blog post where he was calling us out for making very safe bets and saying this is one of the safest game types to make right now. Because the thing is, so many people in games are being super conservative and super traditional and not really investigating what the medium of games is. So all you have to do is be a bit adventurous and think like a designer and say like, well, hey, like, what, if, what if we pay a bit more attention and be a bit more personal and, and instead of trying to do everything, focus on a few small things. And it's, it's, Monument Valley is simply part of a trend of games being a bit more conscious, I suppose, about, about what they are and, and how, the, how they're being done. And, and that's why you're seeing a lot more design influence. And there's a lot of crossover, right? There's a lot more designers getting into making games and a lot of more games people, I suppose, getting educated about design, which is why we're here tonight. Uh, you had a, a question. Yeah. Who else has questions? Just raise your hand so he, he knows afterwards. OK. Let's do one more and then we'll follow up. OK. Yeah, then you can uh, link classes over. You can go home. But I'm, I'm, I'll be here for as long as people want to chat because yeah, it's nice to talk to you guys. I was just curious how the color palettes were uh, designed. Sorry, say that again. How the color palettes? Uh, how the color palettes were designed. That's a great question because you know some people have said like, oh my god, money value, the color palettes and everything. But like the truth is, they're just improvised. <laughs> um, we. I, I intentionally asked the programmers to give me a system where I could keep changing my mind, you know, um, like you would do in Photoshop or in Illustrator. Um, so every, all these colors can be changed on the fly really fast. The fog color, um, the, the, the direction of the light, um, it's so that a single artist like me or like the other artist, there, there's two of us, um, we could change the colors on the fly. And so we'd literally just like fiddle with the values until something nice happened. And really the only... The, like, the one guiding principle, like the one thing that I actually learned from reading was warm and cool. <laughs> so you'll find that most, most of the screens have, um, you know, warm against cool. Um, um, and the other thing I realized is that we were avoiding primary colors. So there's not so much uh, strong reds or, or pure blues or, or greens. It's a lot of oranges and purples and, and cyans. Cyan's great because you can't print it very well, so it works. It it, may, it gives it a very particularly digital feel. Um, yeah, Do we have time for more questions. One more round okay. of applause. Okay. <clears throat>